Hello and welcome to a top the fourth wall where it's our 500th episode! Holy crap, people. 500 episodes of this show about some jackass in a hat reviewing comic books and sometimes other stuff. Atop the fourth wall began as a dream. The dream of creating a website similar to the Agony Booth or Jabutu's movie reviews, but for comic books. And then at some point YouTube existed and I started doing videos. That is the exciting story of this show that certainly doesn't leave out any details whatsoever. But yeah, from the Clone Saga to Marvel, from Captain Tax Time to Superman at Earth's End, it's been a hell of a run so far and I can only hope someday I'll make it to 1000. So in the last several hundredth episodes, we've covered some different stuff. Sonic Live. Stop in your tracks, you insipid hedgehog, or my SWAT bots will prepare today's blue plate special by fracassing your friends. Good job bringing the kids along, Sonic. They certainly have added a lot to the story. One more day. And then she begins to walk in the most awkward of ways. Seriously, this is what she looks like while walking. Holy terror. Make me sick. Now. Sure I will. And they proceed to vomit all over each other. Marvel Super Special number 7, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. What the hell did I just review? What the hell did I just review? Hmm. Two indies and two Marvel. Seems like we're due for something from DC. As such, let's dig into the subject of Atop the Fourth Wall's 500th episode, the maxi-series Future's End. All 49 comics of it. Every non-Patreon sponsored episode this year is meant to be a follow-up to a previous review, and indeed the 500th is no different. For you see, this is my follow-up to Countdown. Yes, I covered Final Crisis, but that was more just about Event Comics Month than Countdown is here. Although, let me clarify that a bit. Aside from some characters featured in both, Future's End is not a sequel to Countdown. In fact, I would argue that it is better than Countdown. It is not good, but it is better than Countdown. 
In this case, it's more a spiritual follow-up. Much like Countdown, Future's End was a weekly comic series that eventually led into a much larger event. That pretty much ignored that it happened at all. It's better than Countdown by being, one, self-contained. While there were tie-in comics, they are completely superfluous and can be ignored in their entirety if for some reason you just wanted to read Future's End. Two, having mostly coherent plot points that all converge much more naturally than the ones in Countdown, where some plots just seem to peter out and make you wonder what was even the point of their inclusion. And three, since it was mostly self-contained, it also doesn't have a crap ton of tie-ins to other events happening in the DC Universe like Countdown did, making you further lost if you were just trying to read the book and didn't know anything else about what was going on at the time. Although in this case, if you were reading DC Comics at the time, those tie-ins I mentioned probably confused the hell out of you if you weren't following it, because Future's End actually ended up interrupting every other comic in the line for the those superfluous tie-ins. Oh, but these tie-ins were just so interesting! Why, we get to see five years into the future for the DC Universe! And all of them come with 3D lenticular variant covers! One, screw variant covers. Two, screw gimmick covers that jack up the price of the comic. Three, those futures are never going to happen. At all. Oh sure, it's a possible future, but your selling point with this was, THIS COULD HAPPEN, when it clearly never would. Even if the plot points of Future's End didn't preclude that future from occurring, the simple fact is that five years is a long time in comics, in and out of story. Status quos change very rapidly in the industry because of events, changed creative teams, or edicts from on high about the direction of the company. The idea that anything would be set in stone five years from now is laughable. One of the strengths of Countdown, which is more a strength of its predecessor 52, where the weekly year-long story came from, is that it didn't follow major characters. The problem with the bigger, more well-known characters is that you tend to be limited by what you can do with them, what sort of lasting character development can be done. More minor characters being the focus allows you a lot more leeway for change, danger, and a bit of an underdog edge to them because they're not the ones most known for saving the day. 52's writers did a fantastic job making you care about all these less popular characters Characters and subplots really want to see what would happen to them, even expanding their popularity because of that. Countdown, not so much, and Future's End sure as hell wasn't any better. It's another thing we'll get into during the review itself, but let me tell you, most of these characters I didn't care for before I read this, and I still don't care about them now. At best, I tolerate or sympathize with the plights of one or two characters in this mess, but most of them can go to hell as far as I'm concerned. Future's End comes to us from the New 52. The end of the New 52. In fact, I'm calling it Future's End for simplicity's sake, since its actual name is The New 52, Future's End. Because, you know, associating it directly with the thing that was no longer a big sales success, nor all that popular, was exactly what the book needed. I guess it's just their way of pointing out that it was the end of that branding, but it's just so silly. Aside from the tie-ins, it's so far removed from the DC Universe by setting it in the future that it might as well be a different continuity altogether. But let's get this show on the road, shall we? Future's End begins with a z- Linkara sits down nonetheless, forces himself through it. Todd? Linkara, he is a man, punch, wears a pretty hat. Purdy hat? Where's the purdy hat? Todd! Link. What? I'm doing the thing. What thing? It's your 500th episode. Aren't you having everybody sing your theme song? What? No, I already did that for the 100th episode. I don't want to do that again. Oh. Oh, okay. I know what you're doing this time. I'll call back later. Wait, Todd, I... Future's End began with a number zero issue released on Free Comic Book Day. If you're not familiar with Free Comic Book Day, it's a massive promotional event utilized by most publishers as an excuse to get new readers. Bring the family down to the comic shop, get a goodie bag full of freebies handed out by the various publishers. DC and Marvel have used it to promote upcoming stories. For example, Blackest Night had a zeroth issue on Free Comic Book Day that served as a prologue to the event. And of course, the same was the case for Future's End. Now as a reminder, Free Comic Book Day is an event celebrated by families and is generally for all ages. Not that there isn't mature content at all, but this is DC, one of the big two publishers pushing this comic above all others for this date. 
So you can imagine the surprise of many comic stores and families when the title DC put out features the mutilated corpses of beloved, well-known superheroes being twisted into cybernetic hell beasts. When this comic came out, everybody was asking me if I was going to be covering this book, and of course the answer was a resounding, Psh, yeah! Hey kids, you like Batman Beyond, right? Well here he is looking over Green Lantern and his two metallic spines that are pushing his head up into the air! I mean, just as a cover, it's fine, standard movie poster-esque featuring the striking image of the cyborg heroes with Batman Beyond floating above it all and the Death Star behind him. I mean, brother I. It's just such a terrible marketing decision for putting this out on free comic book day. The funny thing is that this isn't even as bad as it gets. The actual contents of the comic are so much worse. We open in Central City 35 years in the future. A group of old bearded guys with guns are holing up inside some shelter with a few other people and they want to close the door. However, one of them, a clearly an older version of the Flash villain Captain Cold, is demanding they keep the door open because he is coming. Soon that person arrives. The Flash, now sporting a big Santa beard of his own. So tired. Been running all night. Totally worth it though. Best cardio workout ever. Cold asks if he found anybody else. It's... It's bad out there, Leonard. Not much left. But I only counted a few small bugs outside. This is the weirdest commercial for bug spray I've ever seen. Unfortunately, their defenses do not hold out as something bigger than normal bugs bursts through, and... It's Wonder Woman! Well, to be accurate, it's Wonder Woman's upper torso attached to a robot spider base and her arms replaced with pointy blades. More on that in a bit, but first, very wonky perspective, since the door comes crashing down on this dude here, but Wendy's torso looks about as big as his head, yet they don't appear to be that far away from each other. Flash and Captain Cold try to fight them off as best as they can, but Captain Cold gets his hands chopped off and... Well, I guess even the blades contain nanites or whatever that allow him to be quickly assimilated. Although maybe they should have just coated their entire bodies in them since Flash just uses super speed punches to kill the Wonderbot, the remaining people in the area also being assimilated by tinier Robobugs. As you may have guessed by that picture of Brother Eye on the cover, whom we on this show last saw in the Infinite Crisis review, in this alternate future of the New 52, Brother Eye apparently decided to swap out the Omax for cyborg bug people and is, you guessed, it, taking over the world. Of course! And this is a pretty horrifying realization of a robot apocalypse. Until you stop and think about it for even a minute, here's the question that should be asked about these new cyber bodies. What exactly is gained by doing this? I mean, I guess it's possible that in battle Wonder Woman was cut in half, but assuming she wasn't, what exactly was Brother Eye's reasoning in looking at Wonder Woman, a character who can fly, and saying, you know what she needs? Robot spider legs. Not even normal legs. Specifically, her lower body should be some kind of giant spider creature. Oh, and while we're at it, replace those opposable thumbs with shiny blades. I mean, at this point, why even bother with the torso? There's barely any meat bits left. He's more machine now than man. I mean, that's certainly the case for poor Hawkman on the cover. Apparently, Brother Eye was only really interested in one arm and his wings. Just shove those onto a Roomba, I guess. Look at Jon Stewart here. Why did Brother Eye decide he needed two spines now? But seriously, pushing his head out higher? Adding some spinal bit that attaches to his left shoulder? How is this an improvement? They're gonna be 90% robot anyway, why not just make some robots? Hell, by doing this, it's just made huge, fleshy, vulnerable weak spots for its creations. Aside from the Green Lantern ring, Jon Stewart's a regular human. Vulnerable to disease, fire, and bullets. Structurally, all these assimilated people are now weaker because their main bodies are still the stabbable, shootable, bleeding, gooey bits. This is the stupidest episode of Black Mirror ever. And the best part is that this is not the worst of this goofiness. Yeah, unnecessarily removing Wonder Woman's arms and shoving her onto a robot spider body is not the silliest thing that happens here. But we don't have to wait long to see what it is. Flash is surrounded by the remaining robot zombies, but a voice calls out for them to stop, revealing itself to be Frankenstein. Yeah, DC has their own version of the legendary monster. And no, I don't feel like getting into a pedantic argument about the name. In DC Comics, the character is named Frankenstein, so live with it. I mentioned him back in the Final Crisis review. He was introduced thanks to Grant Morrison's Seven Soldiers maxi-series, and he's had some decent exposure since then. 
But of course, there's his appearance in this issue. Here, as you can see, Frankenstein is freely working for Brother Eye. Flash, you were once a noble warrior, a friend. So I will give you a choice. You may join Brother Eye freely, or I will destroy you. I mean, I know this pyramid scheme has gotten a little out of control, but we can still make this work. Flash naturally tells him to go to hell. And here's probably the most infamous moment of this book. Frankenstein unbuttons his shirt and reveals that Black Canary's face is sewn onto his chest. Brother I showed me the way. I have made her a part of me. Well, not all of her. Just her lovely voice. And the face uses the canary cry at full power and at that close range to pulverize the Flash's body. I have some questions. So, like, are her lungs and throat in there too? Why bother with the entirety of her face when it's just the mouth you need? Oh, and it was very nice of Frankenstein to apply makeup to her eyes and lips. She's gotta be having some body issues right now, and I'm sure she appreciates feeling pretty. Look at the marks on the side here that look like stitches, which would mean that he sewed her hair to his skin! What's the point of her having hair at all? Wouldn't it be easier if you shaved her head? Wait, her eyes and face move and close when she uses the canary cry. Why are they still functional? What are they hooked up to? Is her brain in there too? How easy is it to just move around Frankenstein's internal organs to make room for her head? Why even in the middle of his chest anyway? Why not like an arm cannon or something? And wait, this entire opening sequence showed superheroes being converted into cybernetic horrors. Why not just do that with Black Canary instead? I'm sorry, it's just the longer I look at this, the stupider it gets. It's supposed to just be horrific, and it certainly is, but my disgust gives way to laughter because it's so nonsensical and pointless. Apparently Brother Eye was so advanced that it couldn't figure out how to make a sonic cannon. Nope, only Black Canary's head fused to Frankenstein's chest would do! This is really the image I want you to forever remember about this book. This edgelord nonsense that thinks it's being creepy and interesting, and is instead so very dumb. And remember, this is what DZ decided kids should have on free comic book day. Like, comic, this sort of idiocy deserves an award. And it even tries to top itself on the next page. As we see that in Gotham, Batgirl's lower body is attached to the bat signal, which is projecting Brother Eye's symbol into the sky. What possible reason is there to do that? It's a freaking flashlight. It needs two buttons, on and off. Why did you attach a human being to the top of it? And yet her cape is up in the air too? What, is there like a wind thing under her that's making the cape do that? Or can she just hop around with the signal? Why even have the signal? What purpose does it serve to Brother Eye, who's controlling all these things anyway? And I've got to imagine now that, like, the signal and Batgirl are now interdependent on each other, because that's the kind of thinking that Brother Eye is exhibiting here, meaning it ruined two perfectly good things and made a new thing that's less functional than the two things that it was made out of! Well, what do you know? It's not every day you see the stupidest thing you've ever seen. We get a montage of shots across the Earth to see that not only has Brother Eye taken over, but apparently the spider design is the default model for all the assimilated people. Turns out Brother Eye is just a really big fan of Junji Ito's Gyo. What's even better is that because this series, and this issue in particular, has multiple artists working on it, these spider-leg designs aren't even consistent with the ones we saw previously. Wonder Woman had a full-on spider body with, like, actual segments to it, whereas these are just four legs on a center, which is still dumb, but at least makes slightly more design sense than the eight-legged excess that Wondy was sporting. But yeah, they can't even keep this dystopia consistent! Hell, this sequence even has different coloring, so even though Paradise Island island there has skeletons and robo spider people, it still looks like a very lovely day versus Central City, which has red skies that might as well make it a crisis event. Anyway, Frankenstein narrates to us over this montage. I once was a monster, but now I am so much more. I'll say, you're eating for two now. I used to walk this world alone, but now I am of the many. Now I am part of Brother Eye. Now I carpool. I once thought my flesh was dead, unholy. Turns out it was just mildew. 
but now I see that it is all flesh that is evil, and that's why I added more flesh to myself. It must be purged. The world must be cleansed. So what, are the robotic parts giving the fleshy parts a deep cleaning? If flesh needs to be purged, why are you assimilating it? On this page, we see that London has been assimilated, and John Constantine of Borg here even got to keep a cigarette. Oh, and look, Brother Eye replaced the normal clock face of Big Ben with its own eye symbol. Just to remind the assimilated people of what it looks like, I guess. In Metropolis, the John Stewart Green Lantern and the Jaime Reyes Blue Beetle are traveling through the sewers and talking about their part of a plan. The two of them are supposed to distract the spider zombies so others can shut down Brother Eye's power battery. And thus we see an army of the things converge on them once they get out of the sewer. Oh hey, there's Amazo, who was already a robot. But he wasn't spider-shaped, so he had to change. It's gonna turn out that Brother Eye was John Peters this whole time. Oh, and there's Booster Gold! Hey, Brother Eye, Booster Gold's a time traveler. Want to use that tech or his knowledge of the future to your advantage? No? Just turn him into a giant robot stick bug? Okay, I guess that works too. Somehow, Brother Eye is able to send its nanites into Jaime and assimilate him very quickly. Hey kids, you know that Blue Beetle character who's been popping up in a lot of those DC cartoons you watch? Yeah, here he is dying and being transformed into a robot! You know, it's not even just that this was the thing they gave out to families on Free Comic Book Day. It's that this is the thing they felt needed the most promotional push. The book that was supposed to get people interested in the Maxi series and keep them coming back in week after week for it. Green Lantern gets zapped by an assimilated Superman, who is yet another example of how ludicrous this whole cyber spider thing is. You look at that big muscular torso cut off at the waist and stuck on top of the legs, and it's like looking at a piggy bank of a guy that someone glued on top of a weird Christmas tree stand. But what gets me is that in the background, there are a bunch of regular humans that are being led away in chains! I know I keep harping on how stupid this assimilation thing is, but why the hell are a bunch of people just there and in chains? The assimilation process is nearly instantaneous! Why do you have prisoners or slave labor when you can just assimilate them? I get that there's also a psychological warfare aspect of this with the cybernetic super people and putting the eye on everything, but it just seems like a little bit of unnecessary effort to change Superman's S logo to the eye thing. I mean, he's already got his upper body wobbling on top of the spider legs. Does it really matter what is on the shield? Anyway, Jon Stewart is assimilated. So here are Grifter and Amethyst. Time for backstory! Grifter, real name Cole Cash, is a Wildstorm character who got integrated into the DC Universe as part of the New 52. He has limited psychic abilities and was a trained soldier as part of a Black Ops unit. I know him mostly as that guy who wears a knockoff Deadpool mask. Don't take that remark too seriously. It's just I've never read any stories that he was in where he was particularly compelling. Which means a book like this, where he's actually a main character, would make this an ideal chance for him to win me over. He does not. I'm still not exactly sure why the hell he's in this book. Amethyst, however, is a bit more interesting to me. Amethyst, Princess of Gemworld, was about an average young girl who discovered that she was actually the princess of an other dimensional realm called Gemworld, with various competing houses associated with gemstones vying for domination, and she had been sent to Earth for her own protection. It was mildly popular in the 80s and had quite a varied history with the DC Universe up until the New 52 reboot. As part of the New 52, she did get a new series, A Sword of Sorcery, which kept mostly the same basic premise, Game of Thrones by way of Steven Universe. I quite enjoyed enjoyed it personally, but unfortunately it didn't really keep and was cancelled after only eight issues. Although they did at least have the decency to give it a proper conclusion, rushed as it was. Probably didn't help that, out of nowhere, there was a random crossover with Justice League Dark for some reason. Between that and the culling, what the hell was the New 52's obsession with making books cross over before they were even a year old? Anyway, back to this crap fest, Grifter and Amethyst decide to proceed despite their distraction, you know, being over, and the two heroes who were in on the plan, now having their knowledge and experience, sucked out by Brother Eye. And yeah, the plan fails miserably, and the stupid cover image of Jon Stewart's double spine is shown before the two are killed. And since it's the same as the cover, I guess that means Hawkman's fate is confirmed. No doubt Brother Eye's greatest creation, the evil hockey puck. We cut over to Wayne Manor. 
or rather, Wayne Crater, as the mansion has been destroyed, and there's a giant laser boring down into the ground to get to the Batcave. Since it's 35 years in the future, Batman is conversing with Batman. Or rather, Bruce Wayne is talking with Terry McGinnis, a.k.a. Batman Beyond. There had been some growing attempts to make Batman Beyond a semi-canon part of the DC Universe over the years. I say semi-canon because while there have been occasional crossovers, most of the time it's limited to a what-if future kind of thing, or at least an alternate universe, and this is no different. Terry's upset that the mission failed, but Bruce says it doesn't matter if their plan ends up succeeding. The ends justify the means? It's a bit too close to Brother Eye's logic for comfort. Think what you like, as long as you do what needs doing. We may not be able to stop Brother Eye, but we can still delete Rock and Roll from its database! The plan is for Bruce to travel back in time and prevent Brother Eye from ever being created. I'm still having a hard time getting my head around this. I'm trying to wrap my head around why you're just crouching on a bunch of boxes when you've got a laser drill coming down on your head, but yeah. Terry thinks this plan is crazy, but really, at this point, what other choice do they have? I won't live in Brother Eye's world! Then you and Mr. Terrific should never have built it. Jeez, you accidentally caused one robot apocalypse and suddenly everybody's a critic! Terry is there to give Bruce time to power up his time travel device, since transferring all that energy will destroy the cave's shields. Unfortunately, that's just enough time for Brother Eye to burst through, sending in a horde of spider bots made of members of the Batman of Many Nations, a Silver Age concept that got revamped by Grant Morrison several years back. I have nothing else to add to that fact, it's just that those guys are far more interesting than anything in Future's End. I mean, just to get back on this train of silliness, the knight here looks like he's actually been re built with a larger head so that his mouth can open up with a big pointy spear thing coming out the throat. It's like the creative team made a bet over who could come up with the most ludicrous design elements for these things and put them all in the comic. For the record, Black Canary's face sewn on a Frankenstein's chest still wins. The fight goes on for a few more seconds, but unfortunately, Batman gets shot, stabbed, and his arm cut off at the 30-second mark. Terry manages to stop the remaining bots and buy them some more time, but now Bruce is dying. Hang on. With what, Terry? Just a little humor to disarm the tension! Ha 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 ha! Oh god, I'm dying! Bruce gives Terry the time travel device and tells him to do the job for him. And Terry, whatever you do, don't contact me in the past. Why? Because it would make the story end immediately, and we need to stretch this crap out for 48 more issues. Because not only won't I believe your story, but I'll stop you. I mean, as you may have noticed by now, Terry, I am a colossal dick. Clark, too. He gets involved. He'll just muddy things up. Superman! He gets involved and muddies things up. I mean, we're talking about killing a man here. Only you can stop one face now, Terry! Another cyber zombie, this one of the supervillain Plastique, tries to grab Terry, but Bruce is able to shoot it as Terry goes through the time portal, dragging the remains of the cyborg with him. This... this is not why I lived my life. Still can't really think of any regrets. What about you, spider zombies? To die like this. The truth is, I was wearing hockey pads. Terry and the robot zombie body crash onto a rooftop. And it seems Terry also brought along with him his own AI, of course named Alfred. Alfred identifies where they are, but unfortunately, Issue Zero ends with the revelation that they missed the target date. The event they traveled back to prevent has already happened. They're five years in the future from the then-present of the DC Universe. Which, considering that this came out in 2014, means that this new horrible future that Terry has ended up in is coming true in about a year or so. Yeah, I can believe it. Issue Zero is awful, but the funny thing is that it's also the worst part of the whole of Future's End. Just a pointlessly gruesome and goofy story that had no place being handed out on free comic book day. As a hook to get people to read the weekly series, it's pretty lifeless. The future sucks, so save us, Batman Beyond. That's it. There's a little bit of pathos here and there, but the nature of the situation meant that there was no time to actually have any stronger character bits. But hey, at least they've got 48 issues to really do some strong character stuff, am I right? <laughs> 
So, there are these end-of-comic blurbs that often accompany DC books, usually shilling an interview or an advertisement for something coming up. Naturally, for issue zero, it's talking about Future's End, an all-new weekly series that will forever alter the direction of the New 52. Yeah, I mean, that's technically accurate, since, you know, they stopped labeling things the New 52 after this series, so good job there. But now we need to start talking about the series itself, beginning with the- Wait, what? Likara, I've come to you now with a message from the future. It's not a cryptic puzzle involving numbers, is it? I had one of those a few years ago, and it did not end well. What? No, we're not going to be cryptic about it. This is the future that awaits you and your friends. This is what's going to happen in five years' time. Oh, come on, in only five years? It can't be that bad. <sighs> oh, yeah? Behold the future of the cinema snob. Hello, my friends. Before we get to my re-review of Old Fashion, I'd like to start this episode off with a prayer. Okay, so he became more religious. I don't see what the problem- Dear Lord, kill all your enemies with the fire of hell! And if you can't spare the fire of hell, bury them in the glory of pure flicks until they choke on it. Make sure that if they don't come to Jesus, then they just come blood. Dude, what the hell? And finally, Jesus, in all your Caucasianness, thank you for the cleansing power of fire! It's Brother I's fault. He kept him in a chair Clockwork Orange style and made him watch hundreds of religious scare films until he converted. Wait, Brother I is in the future? Yeah, no one knows where it came from or where it is, but that's what's causing all this. Oh, you sexy little cinema screwed! I got flapjacks waiting for you in the kitchen! Oh boy! Who was that? Oh, uh, he married Fat Grandma. I don't know who that is, but whatever. Brother I made them get married? Uh, oh, no, that happened before he converted. The wedding was beautiful. Okay, so how do I stop Brother I? Lupa? Uh, sorry about that. I've got the connection semi-stable. We don't know where to find it. But uh, I've asked the other reviewers to keep sending transmissions of how things are going for them, and, and maybe that'll be able to help. Be back in a bit. Huh. Well, I'm sure that won't interrupt anything in the next part. It's gonna be the future soon. Never seen it quite so clear. When my heart is breaking, I can close my eyes. It's already.